Good afternoon and thank you all for coming along to the National Security College. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging and by celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today and to pay respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Uh, welcome to the National Security College at the Australian National University. I'm Rory Medcalf, I'm the head of the college. Uh, and it's great to see some familiar faces, but also some new faces in the, in the audience here today. Um, just a reminder to please switch off your phones as we are recording today's event, or at least keep your phones on silent so that you can tweet furiously uh, in the spirit of the information wars that we're talking about uh, here today. The theme of today's uh, special seminar um, or special uh, uh, panel discussion is, of course, one of the hottest topics uh, in the news and in the world today, the role of the mass manipulation of information for, uh, for I guess, for competition between states, for coercion <coughs> between states, or indeed for purposes in non-state security issues, for terrorism, for counter-terrorism, really for, for influence of all political kinds. And um, as someone who's just returned from Donald Trump's America, and that's why probably I'm looking a little bit, uh, a little bit bleary-eyed for probably more reasons than one, um, it's very clear to me and to all of us that the use and the abuse of information uh, and of truth, if you can call it that, um, has become uh, really prime material for the study of national security and for the wielding of real influence. And it's really changing a lot of the dynamics that we uh, who study, study and work in national security policy thought that we, uh, thought that we understood. Uh, so understanding the dynamics of this new age of digital manipulation is absolutely vital to the national interest of countries like Australia. Um, the panel we have today uh, are all experts in their fields, and those fields range widely, as you'll hear in a moment, uh, across cyber security, across interstate relations, across counter-terrorism, across countering extremism, across public policy uh, of all descriptions. But what they have in common, I think, is this, uh, this acute sensibility that informs the National Security College. That is bringing together the rigorous study of national security problems with relevance to the needs of the nation, the needs of the policy community. And so that goes really to the mission of what we do at the National Security College, bringing together the interests of, um, of society and government and the state with the, the rigorous study of the issues at hand. This is really part of a wider set of activities we conduct here at the college that we call uh, our policy engagement program, really, where we bring together our academic experts and policy practitioners. Um, so the other pillars of our work, of course, much more in the space of training and education, more traditionally understood, but this is really core to the value that we add, uh, add in Australia. Um, I guess I'd just note, um, by way of passing before we begin, that we do have an exceptional uh, all-male panel here today, and that's, um, that's partly a function of the fact that one of our speakers, uh, Michelle Price, uh, had to drop out uh, pretty late in the piece, but we do have uh, an extremely talented array of speakers all the same. I would note, just in that context, uh, that if you haven't already got a flyer for our, um, our Women and National Security Conference uh, in a couple of weeks, please pick up a flyer from outside because I think that conference on the 4th and the 5th of April is another of the major contributions that this college is making in terms of contemporary national security thinking and practice. With that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Matt Sussex. Dr. Matt Sussex is the, uh, the director of our academic program here at the college uh, to take charge of proceedings today. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks, Rory. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out here. Let me echo uh, Rory's words in saying that it's just absolutely fabulous to see that. I think this is the third event we've run, primarily driven by the academic team. Uh, in terms of public engagement with hot topics affecting national security. Uh, and, uh, and today's turnout is, is very similar to others. So we're absolutely delighted uh, that you're, uh, you're interested in the things that we have to say. And in fact, we probably could have filled this panel three or four times over amongst my colleagues. There was intense competition for slots. Uh, I was originally going to be uh, uh, mumbling a few words about uh, Russia and uh, hybrid warfare, but uh, fortunately for you, uh, I've made way for speakers much more erudite than I. Uh, we have an excellent lineup today to talk about information wars, and of course, this isn't a, a topic uh, for security policy makers, 
which cuts across a whole sweep of different other arenas that we've typically associated either with the domestic business of the state or with uh, the coercive, punitive functions of the state in terms of uh, outside security. So whether or not uh, information wars find themselves in traditional geopolitics, as we saw in Crimea and as we continue to witness in eastern Ukraine, or whether you find it in compromat against uh, officials, whether you find it in social manoeuvring of, of uh, individual communities, groups, societies, and the influence of domestic elections in the world's most powerful actor, uh, information wars are probably here to stay and probably here also to uh, continue to challenge liberal democracies. And liberal democracies, of course, are not particularly well set up to deal with these types of issues. And to explore that in a little bit more detail, we have uh, indeed assembled, I think, a very fine panel for you today. I don't intend to take up too much of your time uh, and uh, leave the vast majority to, uh, to discussion and the, uh, the thoughts of our experts. Uh, let me introduce, first of all, uh, Professor Roger Bradbury, who is uh, in charge of our uh, strategy and statecraft in cyberspace program. Uh, originally, uh, Roger, is, uh, who'll be known to many of you, I would have thought, originally Roger was a complex systems uh, scientist uh, trained as a zoologist. Uh, but he has since made that transition from animals uh, to other types of animals, I suppose, and studies humans. Um, in terms of they, with the way that they behave uh, in cyberspace. He's worked with the Australian intelligence uh, community for numerous years uh, on a variety of different things, and he's effectively the NSC's chief scientist. I think probably, rather than run through all our presenters, uh, what I might do is give a brief bio of each of them when they come to the lectern. Uh, but just for your information, uh, after Roger, we will hear from Dr. Tim Legrand. Uh, the seating order is somewhat out of whack, but never mind. Uh, Dr. Hororo Ingram. Uh, and to give his final thoughts and his observations on uh, the panelists' views, uh, Professor Paul Cornish in his debut performance for the National Security College. And we're all extremely excited uh, to have Paul on board working with us. Uh, so uh, let me begin then by welcoming Roger uh, to the lectern and ask him to speak for about 10 minutes or so. Thanks, everyone. I'm, I, I'm a scientist, as, uh, as Matt noted. Uh, you, can't, you can take the boy out of science, but you can't take science out of the boys, so you're going to get some science. Um, I'm going to offer you a four-part four scientific hypothesis about what's going on, this current mass behaviour in the political realm. Uh, it's scientific in the sense that it's testable, it's explanatory, and I hope it's predictive. So here's, here's how it goes, and I'll, I'll, I'll gallop through this and we can talk about it later. So the first part, the first point of this hypothesis, which is, and, and they're independent, but they hang together. First part is that humans have uh, a deeply embedded inability to effectively reason. It's deep and, and it's based on our evolutionary past. It's a sociobiological phenomenon. Our reasoning, abil our reasoning abilities, such as they are, had adaptive value in early human evolution because our survival depended on hypersociality. We were weak, we were, we were clumsy, but we defeated the other nasty things on the savannah because we could cooperate in ways that were just unheard of before human beings walked the planet. But this kind of hypersociality has a huge free rider cost. It's always an advantage not to go out and join the hunting band but stay back in the cave. <clears throat> We evolved a capacity to argue and to reason, in quotes, to win arguments to, to make sure that there weren't free riders, to ensure that all group members took their share of the common load and allowed this hypersociality to, um, to, uh, to flourish. So it's rhetoric rather than logic. And rhetoric trumps logic, as, as we've seen in Parliament um, <coughs> all the time. So, and there's very strong evidence for this, very, very strong evidence. Uh, a lot of, lot of psych, uh, evolutionary psychology studies, a lot of studies on fairness behaviour, which is widespread across cultures and seems to be independent of culture and so on. Deeply embedded, deeply embedded behaviour. But this human reasoning, to be successful in a Darwinian sense, doesn't need 
to be truthful. It doesn't need to lead to the truth. It just needs to lead to a shared, agreed position and understanding, which itself then promotes hypersociality and then feeds back and then enhances the group. So that's the, that's the phenomenon, that, the base phenomenon that we're dealing with. Well, how did that play out over the next, over, from, from prehistoric times through to the present? <coughs> what happened, I think, over the, over the period of history is that elites captured this process over the last few thousand years and used it ultimately to create the nation state. They created it because they could create an approved story about about um, uh, 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 about whatever the current situation was. Um, we'll all remember uh, First World War. All the states had an approved story about why they were in the war and all said, Gott mit uns, God is with us. Um, logically, that's dumb, but it worked as an approved story. It worked to, to increase the hypersociality and it worked at the state level. <coughs> What they did was harness this evolved trait of hypersociality to create larger and larger and larger groups, ultimately reaching what I call the dynamically stable complex system that we call the nation state. It couldn't go bigger than that because the, the stories would start to break down. It couldn't go less than that because the state could always elevate the story up. Now, they could do this because they could control the dissemination of the story because the medium in which the stories were were handled and disseminated were very expensive and only the elite had the capacity to manage the story, to manage, to manage the rhetoric because, because books and, and so forth at that time were very, were very expensive. And so you needed an educated elite to control the story and that in itself fed back to create the nation state. So that's why we have the authorised version of the Bible, very important document in that sociological sense. And that's why we have even received pronunciation of English. And we call this civilization broadly. The third part of the argument is that in the middle of this creation of a big story came the Enlightenment. It found a space to flourish in this. It found a place to flourish in one part of one civilization at one time in history. It was harassed and harried because it wasn't part of the, story, the main story, from Galileo to Darwin, but it survived. It survived because it was useful to the elite, not because, and because, because there was a space for truth, for organisation, but the broader story just continued. So it could coexist, the Enlightenment could coexist when there was a single dominant other story in which, in which it could sort of become a symbiont or a parasite to. Darwin wisely kept his views about the human dimension of evolution under a fig leaf because it would have ruined the story. Galileo wisely recanted his heliocentric her heresy in order to maintain, to allow the flourishing of, of, of truth in this little side pocket. So now we come to the last part of my story. The fourth part, the fourth part of this argument says that the emergence of cyberspace as an authentic new domain, come to my lectures and I'll tell you more about that, an authentic new domain of human activity it breaks the nexus between the elite and the story. The emergence of cyberspace has broken this model of elite capture because now, once again, groups of any size can create their own stories and they can close them off by confirmation bias because human beings are not reasonable. So you can get this just as nation-sized nation lumps once closed off the stories. Any size group can now control the story. Groups can fuse and split arbitrarily at all scales because the cost of disseminating the story is now, is now um, negligible and everyone, every splintering group, can have its own authorised version of its own Bible. So the conclusion from this is that, firstly, none of this speaks about truth. I'm not, I'm not saying this is good or bad, I'm saying this is what is. Except perhaps the existence of the Enlightenment, which was this funny little attempt at getting, getting to... Uh, have, having a, an algorithm that creates truth. Um, we're seeing a secular change in the world system uh, at, as a result of the emergence of cyberspace. And it's a greater change in the world system than the Enlightenment itself. And the, because the Enlightenment only affected a small bit of the world, one bit of a civilization in one part of, a, in one part of the world. So as such, there's no, 
as the title suggests, there's no real manipulation going on here as such by individuals or groups. There's no conspiracy. There's rather just a deep shift in the dynamics of the world system and, or, or the human bit of it. And we're seeing the emergence of arbitrarily sized and often ephemeral and sometimes persistent groups rather than the steady equilibrial forcing of groups to conform to the story and the view of a nation state. Um, we're seeing the unshackling of the very small enlightenment group from the dominant elite group. The, the enlightenment group that liked the stuff that we talk about was a symbiont or a parasite on, 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 the, on the former elite group. It was tucked away safely and survived. Instead of, of, of it being a tolerated parasite of a single dominant story of whatever civilization it was in, it's now the enlightenment part is just one story amongst a competing smattering of, noise, of noisy stories that are coming and going, and so has no privilege over any of them. So it may turn out that the Enlightenment itself was but a minor detour in the evolution of the species. They're my comments. <laughs>um, as Matthew said, my, my interest is in public policy and in government and in respect of our, our, our theme today. Cybersecurity is one of those issues which has been rapidly ascending the political agenda with a, a, a meteoric rise that terrifies many policymakers and officials for its sheer incomprehensibility often because of the technical aspects and the, the seemingly numerable opportunities for for influence and for changes in political praxis. Today I want to talk to you about digitising democracy and how our democracy has been radically transformed in several dimensions. Now, there are lots of ways in which we could talk about the digital landscape, but of course you're all familiar with the digital landscape and how democracy, as you engage with it, has transformed. I bet that most of you in your pockets have a mobile phone, and I bet most of you didn't turn it off when Rory said, please turn it off. I imagine some of you even didn't turn it to silent, because we are living in a very connected age. We connect socially with one another. We connect with our, our communities, with our friends, with our families, in what are sometimes called bubbles. We connect with people with similar political beliefs. We connect with people with, we connect with news sites and news media channels who tend to have more or less similar political outlooks to ourselves. As an academic, I'm guilty of this. I go to The Guardian every morning with my cup of coffee and read the latest left-wing whitewash of whatever before going on to the Daily Mail, obviously. <laughs> I don't. But we know this, don't we? We know that our, our engagement with democracy and with our communities and our, our, our social lives has been digitised. And not just in the way in which we consume and understand the world, but in terms of the way in which we communicate with that world. So some of you in here will be on Facebook, some of you will be on Twitter, Instagram or any number of other social media networks. Your voice now is amplified to a magnitude never previously accessible to any political figure in the past X million years. Your voice can be heard 
in California right now, should you tweet at the right moment to the right person or into the Twitter sphere. Your voice could be heard in Antarctica if the exploration missions there have internet access. Your voice can be truly digitally global in respect of a politics and a social, in, in respect of um, a social attitude and a political attitude which has never been experienced before. Now, government is needed to exploit this. Rightly so. Government is saying the way in which our institutions engage with the, the public is important so we can share information more quickly, more rapidly than ever before. People can engage in public consultations, can engage in political debate in a way which they could not previously. So our, 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 the digital services of government are becoming increasingly resonant in democracy today. And of course the channels. The, the news channels of communication, which have the, the orthodoxies of, of the old media, so the Sydney Morning Herald, the Age, those news outlets which we know and trust, are now being complemented by new channels of information. Breitbart, some of you may quiver at the thought of, Buzzfeed, Gawker, new sorts of social media and news media websites which are becoming increasingly popular and influential in dissemination and proliferation of particular sorts of news. Now I want you to reflect on the proliferation of information, the globalisation of information and news in respect of democracy and its pressure points. Now you might think of democracy in terms of its elections, national, regional, local elections. These are orthodox pressure points. You might think of democracy's pressure points in terms of the, the scrutiny of Parliament, so how bills and how legislation is scrutinised and tested through, through parliamentary processes. We might think about political parties and the way in which they organise their political agenda and their manifesto for election. If you're more community-minded, you might be involved in interest groups and the way in which interest groups apply pressure both in a, to the, the wider community, but also to political figures. There are a range of different points at which we apply pressure and have our voice heard, or have influence over the political process, potentially. And yet I suggest today that the cyber domain can and has changed these pressure points in three key respects. Firstly, as, as I've already intimated, the atomization of digital news means that there's now a proliferation of news sources out there these may be credible, these may be non-credible. The debate is open as to how we discern whether news is fair reporting or compromised reporting. Fake news in the discourse of one prominent commentator. Such news is, compromise, is, is easily compromised through digital techniques. What are called botnets are often used to promote particular news stories. Botnets are computer programs which exist virtually and can be used and manipulated by a single point of origin to promote particular news stories or through Facebook, through Twitter or other social media. In other words, the algorithms through which we select our news stories are subject to manipulation. Now this leads to the shaping of new, the news agenda to either promote certain individuals or dis discriminate against certain individuals. Hillary Clinton during the recent presidential campaign was accused of running a child sex ring out of a pizza shop. Again, a piece of news which had no basis in reality, but yet took traction through its promotion online on social media. And we know that the use of fake or planted or even leaked news stories can attack the, can attack the credibility of figures seeking election. This is the fear of Germany at the moment that the a recent hack of the Bundestag in 2015 is being used to against particular individuals who are more left inclined than those who are right inclined. And this might echo some fears that we've had in Australia in a parliamentary hack in 2011. So the, the landscape of news is vulnerable. Secondly, institutions are vulnerable. Um, I'm not here to spruik, but it just happens that I'm going to spruik, that I did a report for um, Macquarie Telecoms and with the NSC on looking at the security of cyber governance in governments and in mid-sized corporations. And we find a very mixed picture of cyber security. Our institutions are vulnerable and yet they are important to us because they speak to public trust. An example of this, the disruption of the census 
the Australian Census in 2016, caused enormous embarrassment to the government, highlighting the vulnerability of both digital services and our trust in those digital services to cyber attack. Of course, institutions can also be targeted to acquire politically sensitive information, which then might be used to influence public debate or embarrass the incumbent government or influence public opinion. Again, the Democratic National Committee's leaking, the leaking of their emails during the presidential campaign is evidence of this. The UK's GCHQ have recently warned the political parties of the UK to tighten up their digital security because of fears, again, that foreign attackers may be able to intrude in their servers and exploit their cybersecurity to leak embarrassing emails. Something that's not necessarily uh, mentioned very often, but law firms have a role in this as well. The protection of their clients' data and security goes to a lot of the litigation processes in courts in Australia, but also overseas. On the line here is a credibility in public institutions and the processes of democracy. And finally, individuals themselves, and I think this is an important point really, individuals themselves are increasingly vulnerable. Decision makers, our politicians, public servants, judiciary, police and security officials and so on are more vulnerable than ever before in this digital landscape. Frankly because, and you know this already, we increasingly rely on digital services to store our emails and our digital and our, and our data. I imagine many of you have a Dropbox account and upload the contents of your computer hard drive regularly to a server in a country that you've never heard of. Or if you have heard of it, you don't know necessarily which country is owning your data at any particular point. An example of the vulnerability this induces is, well, there are many. Let's think about the Red, the Red Cross last year admitted to leaving open a database of blood donors and, their, and the histories that they have to report to become a blood donor, which includes their sexual history. I don't know about you guys, but I'd rather that information was kept private. In 2013, Yahoo lost access to around 500 million accounts. Estimates vary, but millions of accounts were compromised, amongst which we know were current political figures, public servants, lawyers, policing and security, and, ag and security agency officials. Not to say the officials of our future were part of that data set. So those who are not even part of our decision-making processes now were potentially part of that hack. It takes little, ima little imagination to consider the, ram the ramifications of the loss of such personal data. Foreign actors might easily target influential decision makers in government, the judiciary, policing agencies, and so on. They might exploit knowledge of the indiscre indiscretions of their past, their sexual history, drug use, financial investments, or even the indiscretions of their family and friends. They might use this to coerce certain political, legal, or financial decisions, or even non-decisions. They might use this information to subvert ad advice, for example, given to administers, given to ministers. They might use this information to their competitive advantage in competitive tendering processes. In short, the, the possibilities open to foreign attackers, or even domestic attackers, exploiting personal information, I suggest, is severe and it's imminent. Blackmail and extortion are as, whole, are as old as humanity, but the digital age makes the acquisition of this information available to anyone, anywhere, <coughs> with a connection to the internet and the requisite technical skills. So to draw to a close, I suggest, albeit somewhat briefly, that these three vectors of vulnerability amount to a very concerning future. That digital attacks represent a relatively low cost and low risk to the actor means to pursue political ends. Indeed, the cyber landscape is a murky one. You'll note I've not spoken about particular actors Protagonists themselves may be anyone. It's difficult in a cyber age to actually to, to verifiably ascribe blame to specific individuals or states. I think that to some degree is irrelevant because it's increasingly clear that as we as a society ramp up our reliance on digital systems to safeguard our information, our public information, our state's democratic decision-making processes, we're becoming increasingly vulnerable to anyone anywhere with the requisite skills. And we ignore that threat at the peril of a contemporary democracy. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, it does strike me, actually, that uh, when we look at the dark arts of information manipulation, it's, it's somewhat surprising 
that it tends to be located in more or less what we used to understand as soft power. And I think perhaps we've made a couple of errors when it comes to looking at soft power. The first one was to believe entirely Joseph Nye uh, when he said soft power was about getting others to want what you want. And with apologies to my colleagues who've heard me on this on numerous occasions, uh, soft power I think is also about getting others to reject what they have. Uh, and this is very much what we are dealing with when we come to looking at the, uh, the manipulation of information. Uh, the other error I think we made when looking at soft power is in assuming that it was benign and also not able to be goal-directed by different actors, be they states uh, or non-state actors. Now increasingly I think information can be directed. There are many, many metaphors and many models available and I uh, don't uh, intend to, uh, to offer a sweeping new one but amongst the, uh, the litany of hybrid warfare and non-linear warfare and all sorts of other typologies, let me offer you a gardening metaphor. Because I'm coming to the age where gardening is starting to look like an activity that you know, I might reasonably perform. Whereas five to 10 years ago, it never really entered my mind. But increasingly information can be seeded, it can be propagated and spread to other channels where one didn't intend necessarily, but proves to find fertile ground. And it can also be pruned to produce an exactly targeted message, depending on the audience. With that in mind, I think it's interesting uh, and appropriate for me to introduce the work of uh, Dr. Hororo Ingram, whom we share, reluctantly, with the Bell School, uh, but Hororo is an expert particularly on propaganda and on messaging and his specific area of expertise is uh, Islamic State and the Afghan Taliban. Uh, he's recently emerged uh, unscathed from a DECRA, a Discovery Early Career Researcher Award. Uh, well done, Hororo. Uh, and uh, he's working increasingly now uh, with primary sources, uh, primary source materials, I beg your pardon, uh, during his field work in South Asia and also Southeast Asia as well, and, and the Middle East. So he is very much an expert on propaganda and messaging, and uh, let me invite him to the podium to give his thoughts. Harora. Well, um, thank you, Matt, for that appropriately dark uh, introduction um, for what I'm about to say. And uh, thank you to the NSC for the opportunity to speak here today. So what I want to do is um, highlight some of um, ISIS's propaganda. It's like highlight how ISIS's propaganda campaign has evolved from 2014 to 2017. I'll then make some observations on how this should sh kind of shape our understanding of the strategic logic of their messaging campaign, and I'll conclude by kind of drawing out some implications for uh, combating it in this information uh, theatre. Now, from its uh, peak, say through late 2014 to early 2015. The ISIS decline is now uh, very much into a free fall. Politico-militarily, ISIS are significantly worse off than they were even nine months ago by almost any measure. So take, for example, the global coalition against uh, Daesh recently reported that ISIS has lost over 60% of its territory uh, that it once held in Iraq, 30% uh, of what it once held in Syria. And this represents more than just a territorial loss because it also means the freeing of millions uh, of people in these areas who were formerly uh, under varying degrees of its control. Now ISIS generates much of its finances and of course its uh, manpower from these local populations. So this is more than just a great uh, humanitarian um, achievement. Of course, the war itself is inflicting uh, crippling losses to ISIS's uh, personnel and resources. Meanwhile, uh, the foreign fighter numbers and foreign support in its various manifestations has, have plummeted um, compared to earlier uh, peaks. Most painfully for the group, I suspect, has been the killing of key leaders. Movements like ISIS are designed uh, organisationally and strategically to deal with loss. It's part of the business. But brilliant strategists, uh, pivotal hubs in tribal and logistical networks, powerful symbols, uh, kind of symbolic figures. They have been crucial to ISIS's rise during periods of boom, vital to their survival in periods of bust. And so such losses uh, very, really hurt this group. Now, while these politico-military indicators are great, I would argue uh, that the clear decline of ISIS's propaganda machine, particularly in the last few months, is 
most heartening, uh, particularly for me and many others who have closely followed this group. Sure, ISIS propaganda output as a quantitative measure has been well down from its 2015 peak for some time now. While there is a quality to quantity, the strategic downsizing and streamlining of ISIS's propaganda campaign in late 2016 did not necessarily mean a less potent ISIS propaganda effort. Uh, there was a very, very real potential for the opposite to be true. That this strategic shift, that this strategic downsizing and streamlining would actually result in a more potent uh, propaganda machine. And I think that this shift was really encapsulated in about September uh, with the release of uh, Ramir magazine, which replaced a kind of a suite of uh, multilingual magazines such as Darbuk in uh, English, uh, Daryl Islam in French, uh, Constantinople uh, for Turkish speakers. And for a couple of months, um, I think there were many analysts who felt that perhaps ISIS was pulling this streamlining off. Um, you know, that the Wilayet-based uh, media units would produce propaganda for locals. Some of that material would then find its way into transnational dissemination. Um, while Ramia emerged as its flagship um, for transnational propaganda. Um, and, and, and the idea behind it was, well, we, as in ISIS, use uh, content from Al Naba, its Arabic newspaper, and this provides a consistent messaging across a range of different transnational audiences, while also producing exclusive content in sections called exclusive content, for specific target audiences, specific linguistic target audiences. Um, while overall a better synchronicity of um, messaging across its various formats. And as I said, I think through September and October, we, see, we, we, start, we start to see this synchronicity uh, play out with Ramia 1, um, uh, themes in Ramia 1 playing out in videos such as the Slaughterhouse video, Making of Illusion, or Ramir's uh, Just Terror section, um, its instructional section, uh, being synchronised with an instructional video uh, called How to Slaughter the Disbelievers. Um, but this synchronicity, this streamlining strategy did not last long. Uh, war is affecting ISIS's local propaganda efforts, while Ramia has stumbled through its last two or three issues with uh, error field translated material, uh, diminishing and weak exclusive content, comparatively poor synchronicity across formats, and um, much less prominent instructional material being released by its official uh, outlets. The slack of which has been picked up by um, some unofficial forums, but nevertheless, these trends are significant. And Furthermore, given the central importance this group places on propaganda and its strategy, these trends are all very telling, a significant barometer of the depth of ISIS's decline. While there is no doubt that efforts to disrupt ISIS's online networks have uh, significantly impacted its reach in the online world, while cyber efforts targeting Ramia have taken its toll on the quality of the material being produced, um, I'm most interested in the decline of the content, the quality of its propaganda, as an instrument to shape the perceptions and polarise the support of friends, foes and neutrals. That steep decline in quality has occurred for a range of reasons, but two are particularly significant. First, the loss of key propagandists, most notably Abu Muhammad al Fakan, um, also referred to as Dr. Wail al-Fayyad, and uh, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani. And these losses must have been huge for the organisation. This is a group as my colleague from the US Naval War College, Dr. Craig Whiteside, um, reminds us, this is a group that puts its best and brightest into propaganda roles. Losing the equivalent of Steve Jobs after the second iPhone would have hurt Apple, and the equivalent has hurt ISIS, except they lost the equivalent of two, um, if the value of Alpha Khan and Al Adnani um, is in fact accurate. Of course, something else has been going on that has helped to diminish the quality of ISIS uh, propaganda, and it's rooted in the trends I opened with this afternoon. ISIS's politico-military decline. Contrast the content of ISIS messaging now with 2014-15. 
In 2014-15, ISIS messaging was dominated by narratives and imagery promoting what Bernard Faure would call its competitive system of control, its politico-military strength compared to its enemies. And it did this using what, what would be described as rational choice appeals in its messaging, something that I'm sure seems quite weird for people to hear that ISIS messaging is dominated by rational choice appeals. But it was. To local and regional audiences, ISIS messaging prioritised these rational choice appeals that asked target audiences to consider ISIS in contrast with alternatives. They know what perhaps we in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency uh, too often forget, that you don't need to be perfect in asymmetric warfare, you just need to be better than your opposition. Look at Darbik during this same period, the English language magazine. Targeting transnational audiences well away from its areas of control, ISIS nonetheless wove together these rational choice appeals with what we'd call identity choice appeals, messaging that asked supporters to think and act because of who they are, in this case as Sunni Muslims. Slick production had a small part to play, but much of the potency of ISIS messaging to appeal to audiences during this period arguably lies in this interweaving of rational and identity choice appeals that thus aligning very powerful decision-making processes in their audiences. So let's fast forward to 2016-17, where the dominant message from ISIS's propaganda machine was once for supporters to join their ranks, to support their caliphate, and to be on the right side of history as it hurtles towards the apocalypse. Their message now emphasises the value of struggle during hardship, that now is the divinely foretold period of struggle, destruction, and death when the ranks must be purified. Now, these trends in ISIS propaganda undoubtedly represent opportunities for state and civil um, society groups to shape their online and offline messaging, um, hopefully, of course, synchronised with real action in the real world. But my fear is that ISIS, well and truly on the ropes, um, that a combination of short-sightedness and wishful thinking may limit these efforts reaching their full potential. Worse still, that ISIS's decline is so apparent that complacent, complacency kicks in. An attitude of, uh, the caliphate has crumbled, your apocalypse didn't come, what more is there to say? Our actions will speak for themselves. While the contrast between ISIS propaganda, circa 2014-15 versus 2016-17, says it all. Now, this thinking and the messaging it will produce will resonate, but it'll resonate with ourselves and with those who are already sceptical of ISIS. And of course, it may resonate with some who are in that grey zone that we're competing for. But we need to be targeting our message to those most susceptible to ISIS messaging, where the competition really lies. And to do that, there are nuances in ISIS messaging that must be taken into account. So let's focus for a moment on ISIS's caliphate and apocalypse claims. Within the broad messaging trends that I've described, comparing 2014-15 to 2016-17, are nuances which are important for us to consider, particularly those who are in the business of developing policy and strategy. You see, ISIS messaging deploys a kind of hedging strategy, which imbues its propaganda with elasticity over time. This is achieved by drawing upon four spectrums of appeals that run through its propaganda campaign. Now, on either side of these spectrums sits a theme, which ISIS messaging will prioritise, dependent on strategic conditions. So one spectrum has statehood, epitomised by the caliphate, sitting on one end, and on the other is this is themes of struggle and sacrifice. For another spectrum, there is conventional politico-military efforts, uh, conventional operations, bu bureaucratised, uh, institutionalised kind of governance, and on the other, unconventional politico-military efforts, terrorism, guerrilla warfare, and functionally reaching into communities despite not having an institutionalised control. Another spectrum is building the ranks with foreign fighters and targeted recruitment to the territories, and on the other, purifying the ranks, encouraging homegrown terror and martyr operations. And on the fourth, it emphasises the caliphate and the collective, while on the other, the apocalypse and making personal appeals. Now, during its boom-bust history, ISIS will tend to prioritise messaging on one side of the spectrum over the other, but the messaging from that, the other end of the spectrum, does not disappear. If you look at Rumiya 7, it talks about the value of the caliphate, the importance of supporting it. It's just that it is dominated by ideas of purifying um, the, the ranks. 
destruction, sacrifice. Now, this is the thing about apocalyptic groups and their messaging. Their most skilled propagandists know to hedge their bets. They don't just throw it all on black. They don't say, yes, the apocalypse is coming tomorrow, because if it doesn't, you look kind of stupid and you lose a lot of credibility. And ISIS have done this, and we need to recognise this hedging strategy that they, that, that, that they use. Confronted with the surge and awakening in 2007, um, ISIS are facing similar dynamics in 2017, and they will act similarly. Look at their propaganda now. It features old speeches and publications from that period, especially from the leaders of that period, Abu Umar al-Baghdadi and Abu Hamza al-Muhajir, who he dismissed as incompetent, and it turned out that they were strategic geniuses. It highlights that they will highlight in their current propaganda um, examples from that period of, 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 of the struggle and of the benefits of the struggle. And they'll remind their supporters to dismiss their enemies' claims because they will be disproved again. All this needs to be calibrated into current messaging efforts. And this is merely one of many examples of how the devil is very much in the detail. So I just want to very quickly conclude with two points. First, propaganda will remain central to ISIS's strategy. And so defeats to that machine have repercussions that shape this organization to its core. For ISIS, propaganda, and this quotes essentially from their doctrine, propaganda lights the path and revives negligent minds. It is deployed as a multifaceted force multiplier for their own advantage and an equally multifaceted force nullifier against opponents. All mediums, not just the internet, will be essential to ISIS as it reverts down its strategic phases of its campaign strategy and it keeps its agenda alive. Uh, secondly, our strategic communications efforts um, continue to improve, but there remains a long way to go kind of cliched, superficial understandings of our enemies, whether they are ISIS or um, other states, simply won't cut it. The target audience we are battling for with ISIS, that relatively small proportion of people who are actually susceptible to ISIS messaging, are not ideological automatons blindly following the theology. Nor are they bloodthirsty lunatics or a hybrid of both that are beyond our reach. They are human beings who, as the behavioural econ economists remind us, are dominated by automatic thinking, who use mental models like identity and narratives as lenses, and for whom social factors further shape how information is interpreted and decisions are made. Empirical research has shown how propaganda takes advantage of these dynamics to, for example, manipulate cognitive biases and stunt deliberative thinking in audiences. Now, whether we are charged with confronting state or non-state adversaries in the information theatre, there are some fundamentals we must understand and harness to our advantage. I think central of which is this idea that we don't need to be perfect, we just need to be better than our opposition. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Aurora. Um, when Charles Darwin was preparing The Origin of the Species, his uh, first attempts uh, were described, I think, as a sketch of an abstract of a pricey of an introduction. So I propose to do that with Paul Cornish's CV, uh, otherwise we'll be here for a little while. Um, for those of you who don't know Paul, uh, he is one of the world's absolute top cyber security scholars. Uh, he spent two different stints at Chatham House, firstly as a senior researcher in the 1990s, uh, and then subsequently as the Carrington Professor of International Security and the head of the International Security Program at Chatham House from 2005 until 2011. Um, about the same time, he also developed and led uh, Chatham House's highly successful cybersecurity, pol uh, cybersecurity policy research program. He's a member of the UK Chief of the Defence Staff Strategic Advisory Panel. He's a fellow of Oxford University's Global Cybersecurity Capacity Building Centre and a senior associate fellow at RUSI. So he has a long and storied CV. Uh, and uh, with that, let me invite him up to give some thoughts on what he's heard today. Matt, thank you very much. I'm, I'm blushing deeply, really, from that uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. I'm blushing even more, though, now that I see that um, Rory has gone. Um, Rory is actually, of course, my boss for the next month. So um, now that he's gone, I can actually be um, rude about his use of grammar. We were introduced as a, uh, an exceptional all-male panel as opposed to an exceptionally all-male panel. <laughs> uh, and of course, I think every woman in the audience uh, had this little thought, there's no such thing as an exceptional 
male. Um, but, but there we are. What I'm going to do is just pick out, really, all I can do, having heard such excellent presentations, and indeed your own comments, Matt, is, is just to pick out some of the things that struck me most, and then perhaps give you some of my own, my own ideas. Um, the first, really, was something that you said, actually, Matt. You talked about um, the information uh, wars in both traditional and non-traditional uh, strategic environments, strategic contexts, and you said that they're here to stay. And my thought at that stage was, well, they never went. They've always been there. We've always been familiar with these ideas in broad terms about um, mass manipulation, information wars, and indeed propaganda and so on. So these are very, very familiar ideas. We mustn't forget that. Um, then on to Roger. Um, Roger. Roger's remark struck me in several ways. First of all, this notion that the, the nation states, this I think was a fundamental point, that nation states can no longer control the story as effectively uh, as they used to. And if you want a good example of that, think back to the Arab Spring in the Maghreb when Facebook was used as the, for, as the means for di distrib uh, distribution of intelligence um, or, uh, among, the, uh, among the masses and Twitter was used as the command and control system. Uh, the use of social media in deeply atomized, distributed ways, completely beyond the control of all the state governments involved. Um, I use the term atomized a lot, and I know Tim did as well, and I think it's absolutely bang on. The atomized, uh, or if you want another term, the self-curated uh, version of reality. Um, this is what was going on. Um, Roger then, I think, finished by saying that the Enlightenment story no, has, no longer has a controlling or a privileged or a dominant position, um, and described the Enlightenment as tellingly as a minor detour, I think, horrible, to paraphrase you horribly, Roger, a minor detour on the human evolutionary story, and at which I thought, well, we are really, we are really all stuffed, if that's the case. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my God, I'm, I'm trying to get my flight back tomorrow. Um, um, I mean, the Enlightenment, of course, was not just about um, science and discovery, it was also about tolerance, um, and indeed fundamentally and ultimately about human rights. Uh, so heavens above, we can't, we can't lose sight of that. On to Tim's remarks. Uh, very tellingly, very strikingly, uh, I liked, Tim, what you said about the proliferation and the globalization of news. This is, I mean, you use a term that we're all very familiar with from the, uh, the, the weapons of mass destruction dialogues over the past decade, something I worked on a lot during the Cold War. Uh, and it is proliferating, yet this is news. This is supposed to be the proliferation of truth. Uh, this is supposed to be the great cosmopolitan liberal experiment in, in revealing to all of us the truths about everything. It's supposed to have been a really good idea. Um, and I think we're all having second thoughts. He talked about the new pressure points on democracies, atomized news again. Uh, and then finally, uh, you, you, you mentioned that individuals are becoming um, increasingly vulnerable. And this struck me again. If, if we are atomizing news, we're also atomizing, in a sense, vulnerabilities. And if you're atomizing vulnerabilities, if down to the individual level, each of us here is feeling differently vulnerable, differently exposed, then what you're also doing, and this must resonate with state governments, is you're atomizing politics in a very, very different way. And I think that that's important to think about. And then finally, on to Aurora, the decline of the ISIS propaganda machine, very strikingly put, I thought, something I've been um, working on, not working on, but reading about. I'm editing a uh, a book at the moment about how, how crap the world is at the moment and it's all going to go get really crappy by 2020. Um, and, and one of these is, is a scenario really to do with, with ISIS. Um, my response to what, you, to what you said about the, um, the ISIS propaganda machine, um, Aurora, was that if, if, as some say, the, the word Daesh, that we've been mistranslating it as Islamic State IS or ISIL or ISIS and so on, if what Daesh actually means is more dynasty, than state, um, then it's going to be back. Uh, it will be back. They're already thinking about it. They're already reconfiguring their, their propaganda, their messaging. And, and if indeed, and this is a long shot, if we can conceive, and some people do, if we can conceive of ISIS uh, or Daesh and Al-Qaeda beginning to collaborate at some point in the future, uh, what Al-Qaeda need is military experience, and what ISIS are going to need is space to operate. If they could somehow get together, then there's going to be another big story to tell. And let's not forget as well that the, even the, the word propaganda, the word propaganda has always been and is always contested and is now even more challenged, uh, as several people have mentioned in the course of, um, uh, of the seminar, of the, of the uh, discussion. Um, well, referred to what's going on in the States, I think, at the moment is, is, is all I need to say about that. So now my job as discussant is to tell you what my colleagues should have said. Um, <laughs> Uh, information wars, the fine art of mass manipulation in the digital age. 
Um, I, I think the, the broad question, the underlying question in this is whether cyber security, something that we've all been working on here uh, for a long time, whether it's becoming somehow more civilizational than technical. It's as broad a challenge as that, or is it? I mean, I, I happen to think that cyber security has, has really come into the main frame in something like the last six months or so, really since the DNC attacks and that sort of thing. It's become, it's elevated itself onto a, a new and very much more important level. I think the problem of cyber security, and I've always thought this, I think I used this model when I was speaking here last, um, about a year ago. Um, I like to think of it not just in terms of the zero day problem that, we're, that we've heard about, the problem of an attack, an exploit that just happens with no warning, uh, but also the zero source attack. We have no idea where it came from. And the zero intent attack. No idea what it's for. What do they stand to gain? So let me just go through those very quickly. The immediacy problem, as I call it, the zero day attack. How much warning um, can we expect? Do we need? Um, how do you know when an information war has begun? What on earth does this thing look like? Um, when did it begin? We know what happens when a proper war begins, you know, something goes bang. What happens in an information war? And how do you know, importantly, when the information war has ended and truth has reasserted itself? All of those problems, all of those questions, I think, require um, intelligence from trusted sources. Um, I was speaking at a... Uh, at a conference in Leancolin in, in Oslo a few weeks ago, and I, at some point in my, in my remarks, I, I, I said that what NATO needs is British intelligence, and I got an enormous guffaw from the audience. But anyway, <laughs> you, we all need intelligence uh, from these trusted sources. But who are, where are these trusted sources? Um, there's also a requirement for intelligence sharing, um, but with whom? Who can be trusted? Who in the Republican Party in the US trusts the UK's government communication headquarters at the moment. Um, agency, the zero source problem. Who or what is conducting information wars or mass manipulation? Um, we've, we're familiar with problems of ambiguity and plausible deniability. All these are very familiar problems. But what we're seeing more and more is the blurring of agency boundaries. We've got the individual criminal, the corporate criminal, the state criminal, the state corporate criminal. Um, Jim Lewis, uh, a US academic, um, in uh, CSIS in Washington, who was very certain he was going to have a very big job in the um, Clinton administration. Um, <laughs> uh, in Boston about a week ago, the shell shock um, in, 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 in the US uh, among the, um, the, uh, the wannabe Democratic um, administration is huge. It's going to last for four years. Um, they're just deeply shocked. Anyway, he said this. The Slivoki, the security establishment, I'm sorry, I pronounced it horribly badly. Um, the Slivoki and criminal gangs in Russia, he wrote, are so tightly integrate, integrated that in some areas it's seamless. And he made a key point that this seamless network is shifting from domestic to foreign policy. And now we have state-sponsored privateering. If you want to find a big event in the last few weeks, look no further than the 15th of March uh, 2017 indictment by the US of four Russians for the, uh, for the Yahoo attack. Big, big event. Probably bigger than the US indictment and naming of the um, uh, People's Liberation Army, the Chinese officials, a, a couple of years ago. So what next? Well, maybe we're going to see autonomous individuals acting on behalf of states with no it's kind of distributed Al-Qaeda style of command structure. Nobody needs to give orders, nobody needs to tell anybody anything. You just do it because you know it's right and you're, you're acting on behalf of a big message. And then finally motive, the zero intent problem. We need to know what the adversary wants to achieve and how badly he or she wants to achieve it. Otherwise, it's difficult, if not impossible, for us to make a proportionate response. So my sense is, with that, that structure of zero day, zero source and zero intent, that this is more a problem, not so much of mass manipulation, as a problem of elite ignorance. Um, what's the effect of this? Well, as I said at the beginning, mass manipulation, information warfare, what's new? Uh, same old, same old. Do they actually matter very much? And it's not a very fine art in any case. Um, I think the speed and the scope and the volume of information transfer at one level make old things, um, for example, breaches of sovereignty, breaches of borders. They make these more possible, but in different ways. Um, ISIS, for example, is publishing an online guide to propaganda. So it's actually proliferating the idea or the science and art of propaganda. Uh, we can also see 
new things happening, new, new things, really new things, such as, as, as I mentioned earlier, Russian interference in, uh, in elections in the, in not just the US, but also very probably the UK and France and Germany, and in time, it'll be here in Australia. So what could all of this mean at the minimum? I, I think we're looking at familiar old problems of security and terrorism, all of these things in new guises, as I've just said, at the maximum. Perhaps this is corroding trust, corroding trust in national and international politics. In other words, all politics uh, at a very rapid rate. In other words, perhaps we really are facing the oblivion that Rog was talking about. ICT, information and communications technologies, were meant to be the vehicle for a great liberal cosmopolitan experiment, revealing, opening up, but perhaps globalization is in some way now beginning to consume itself. Neil Ferguson, who's a British historian, uh, centre-right historian and columnist, wrote uh, just about a month ago, he wrote this, laugh out loud, he said, laugh out loud if you dare. Globalisation is in crisis, populism is on the march, authoritarian states are ascendant. I'll finish with that, but just with one final word. Information war, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, can be both domestic and foreign. If you want a sense of how complicated this is becoming, just, just think that, that the Chinese, uh, the Chinese government actually is, is, is now coming out and saying it would probably prefer social media in China to be uncensored and uncontrolled, completely open like it is in the West. Why? Because it allows the Chinese government to really get a grip on what is going on. Thank you. Hi, Chris Farnham, National Security College. I just wanted to talk about the, the most recent and well-known uh, version of, of uh, propaganda and information wars is obviously the recent US election and the idea of fake news. We saw a lot of this news that was being generated, wasn't actually generated by the Republican parties and by the actual political actors. They were uh, created by individuals and then propagated by other individuals in Eastern European countries that were doing it to raise advertising revenue. They, they were non-political actors. And a result of this idea of fake news is that we're now seeing organisations like Google and Facebook controlling fake news and vetting the news that is on their websites. And there's even talk that in part of high school curriculums, uh, students are going to be taught how to identify fake news. Does that mean that we're going to be seeing a shift in the way that the new form of propaganda is created and used? Or are we just seeing uh, the controls of information handed over to, to new actors? I think that's probably one for Tim in the first instance, and then mm, sure. we'd like to go. Is this working? It is. Um, thank you very much for the... Uh, I wouldn't call that a Dorothy Dix, I would be hoping that a colleague would ask me a nice easy one to start with, but that's all right. Um, look, I think that, I think absolutely the way in which propaganda, if that's what we want to call it, is the way it, the way it operates and is used and deployed now is absolutely going to change as technologies change. So it's not just the content, I mean, I think this is an important point, that um, it is important that we produce amongst young children and young adults, everyone, critical thinking about not necessarily taking literally or taking at face value the news that is given to us. I think that is important. But it's not just about the content of news. I think it's actually the way in which it's structured and disseminated, which is changing. And so it's not just the, 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 the interpretation of particular news stories. It's the fact of some news stories being elevated above others. So it's a structuring of an agenda, I think, that's becoming embedded in contemporary propaganda or contemporary models of, of influence. So it's the, the manipulation of, of Google's algorithms, for example, to put in place particular search items in autocomplete, which some of you may know of. You, know, you start typing into the Google search bar and some suggestions drop out of that as an algorithm. Now that's something that can be manipulated. I and mean, that's quite a base example, but a lot of the, the, the news um, collation websites like, like Google, like Yahoo, operate on those algorithms and select and privilege particular forms of information which seem to be popular at the time. And they can be gained, they can be manipulated. Um, and that's, that goes to all the information that we access through search engines. That, you know, they're controlled by a particular sort of filtering and algorithmic sorting which can be changed and adapted. Now, that's a long way of saying that the political agenda is subject to 
people who are able, or agencies that are able to game those algorithms. And so the structure of political information, I think, itself is changing in, in propaganda. Anyone else? Oh, I'd just you know, add a couple of points to that, I think. Um, firstly, I, I, this is a much broader point, I guess, is that when you look at how um, propaganda, the, the, the term itself has actually evolved throughout time, I think that it's actually quite telling about how we in the West have come to interpret this. I mean, the very fact that we refer to it as the dark arts and the black arts, I think, is problematic in itself. I mean, there was a time where the term propaganda didn't have negative con connotations. It was had a very pragmatic kind of definition. What changed it um, within this Western context was, frankly, World War I. And, you know, the report by, uh, by uh, Ponsonby, you know, who kind of said that, that, that the defilement of a man's soul is much worse than essentially ripping him apart with bullets. And, and, and so this fundamentally changed not just um, because so much of your perceptions and the expressions of how you think are, are manifested in words. When propaganda became a derogatory term, it changed the culture, the intellectual culture around propaganda and, and, and what this thing is and how it should be used. Now, you then see throughout the history of the West's involvement in this is that, um, you know, so on the back of World War II, our response to the Nazis, to the Nazi um, propaganda machine and we're in awe of it and oh, look how slick and great it is. And, and of course, we're dealing with the, the delay that we shut down all this messaging, these propaganda units. So then there's the time delay of bringing them all back up again. And once we sober up and get calculating and predatory about this, we, along with our political and military actions, defeat it. We have that success, we shut that all down, and we do the same thing with the Cold War. We have that success. Fukuyama tells us that, that, that we've got this thing covered, we don't, need to, we don't need to sell ourselves anymore, we shut all that stuff down, and then the wars on terror happen, we suddenly drill, oh, we, we better start doing something again. So we have these, th 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 there's a real deep historical and cultural, th cultural problem that we have here. I mean, I think a lot of our adversaries are laughing that the masters of political communication democracies going all the way back to the ancient Greeks that we're struggling with communication. I mean, it's like this bizarre, ironic kind of historical joke and we're the brunt of it, you know, we're the, pit, we're, we're the, um, we're the final line. And I suppose the second point is that when you talk about conspiracy theories and fake news to demonstrate the sophistication of the ISIS machine, although I don't want to give them too much credit, in Darbik they warn their supporters of conspiracy theories of fake news. And they say to them, you are succumbing to the thinking of a kufa, of the kufa, of the disbelievers, when you perpetuate the lie that September 11 was by the Jews and the Americans. And you undermine, you sully and dilute the genius that is our efforts to strike at the heart of, 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 of America. And now anyone who's been to the Middle East knows that these conspiracy theories have this immense kind of hold, how quickly they spread. And you have to be on the ground to actually get a real sense of it. Well, ISIS confront that by saying that if you engage in this kind of rubbish, um, you are helping the enemy and, and, and you are um, undermining us. Can I add a couple of quick points, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, just I'm very, just looking around the room. Sorry, <laughs> very quickly. I, I think it's a great question, Chris, and it's, it, it struck me that um, I mean, there is this wonderful irony at the moment that Donald Trump is castigating um, everybody, really, <laughs> for, yeah. for all these uh, the leaks from the White House to the New York Times. And in almost the same breath, uh, he describes the New York Times in the most unflattering terms and says that everything they produce is fake. So, you know, exactly <laughs> what's his problem? Is it true or fake? Whatever. Um, I, the, the sort of soft um, liberal in me says that there probably is going to be, um, this is all cyclical. We're going to, we're going to get wise to this. Uh, there is going to be a Darwinist culling of all these charlatans, uh, and it will happen at some point. I don't know when. But what I think, what I think we can do with, with uh, young, with children, uh, you know, very young children, uh, from, the, from, the, from the start, really, and certainly with, with university students, is just to impress upon them something that everybody in this room knows you know, intuitively that actually you don't just trust the first thing you read. You, you go for the second source and even the third source. What every good journalist does, they don't just pick up one story and then repeat it. Uh, they actually investigate and they, they check their sources. So I'm not suggesting we need to teach 
um, young people to mistrust everything they come across and to uh, abandon the hope there might be something that could approximate roughly to something like truth. They, we don't need to teach them that rather dark view of the future, but we can also, but we can teach them not to be completely credulous. I might run a couple of questions together. Yes, and then you, sir. G'day, uh, Nick Stewart from the Canberra Times. Arguably, uh, you can decide whether that's a fake news institution yourself. Um, uh, 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 thanks for four excellent speeches. Um, I was wondering, you, you, we've looked at various defensive techniques, for example, closing down the uh, uh, Google and um, uh, trying to uh, alter the algorithms. Um, I'm wondering whether or not some of the uh, tech geniuses who've started these companies actually uh, desire to do that anyway. But uh, is there also a need to actually engage in offensive strategies by instead reinforcing the Enlightenment project by saying that, that we, we need to reinforce the BBC or the ABC, other, other organisations to purvey supposedly quality journalism such as that. And then you, sir. Hello, uh, David Goyne. Look, this is something that I'm following on from what Paul said and then Hararo as well. It, it strikes me that the world is being subject to three forces at the moment. Technology, probably part of this an enabler. Connectivity, which is a very big enabler. But the third one is political disillusionment. And the trouble is that political disillusionment has made people vulnerable to this. In other words, if we had a greater faith in our own politicians, our own systems, we would be more immune to this. What can we do to rebuild that immunity? It, to me, is the question. So, offensive cyber, Roger, do you want to well, take that one first? Okay, look, I'll, I'll try and pick up flavour of both those, uh, both those very interesting questions. I think we've got to be very careful to separate out the broad phenomenon that's going on here from what you might call the epiphenomena. Of course, the epiphenomena are that people are going to exploit these changes that are occurring in the world. There are going to be commercial forces will try and exploit it uh, for gain through there will be political forces trying to exploit it through propaganda and, uh, informa and information wars and so forth. But the, but the underlying change that's going on is this, is this issue that we are pre-programmed to, through evolution, to believe what our group believes. That we've got a bias to, our, to the group belief. And that's been well established. When that group was controlled by the elite and was the nation state, things were hunky-dory. We could have an ABC, we could have a BBC, we could have a Canberra Times that was broadly believed because we all, be that was our group. Once the, now that the groups are becoming of arbitrary size, splitting and forming and, and at all scales, that, that issue of what's my group and therefore what, what do I believe in also suffers, and I think this is going to go to your group, it's not so much disillusionment, it's just that there are multiple versions of anything that, that is occurring in the world simultaneously uh, uh, in play, and, your, and the group that you think you're in is the one that you would have a bias to believing. Now, none of that says that, it, none of that has anything to, to say about truth. The, the, the Enlightenment Project has a lot to say about truth, and the Enlightenment project, as I said, was grafted on to, to, nation, to the nation-state group for a period of civilization. But that's breaking down now too. So I think we are, um, we are in for really rough, uh, a rough ride as we try and establish how we pass verifiable, authentic, um, unbiased knowledge on from one, you know, through the world. It's, uh, we're, we're losing it at the moment. Yeah, on the, on the defense of offensive, I, I was going to say, what, what was it that Trump said to the BBC um, in that press conference? Oh, BBC, yeah, you too. Canberra Times, yeah, you too. Um, yeah, I mean, there is, you know, there is a, a, there's been a big, um, I was going to say sea change. Not, it's not really a sea change. The only sea change has been in the willingness of governments to actually say they now do offensive cyber. Um, and also to say that if it gets to that point, then we, we might even react in kinetic ways. In other words, we might actually use military force in response to an attack. So there's been a, a really significant ramping up 
um, of, of the rhetoric, but not just the rhetoric. You know, certainly in the UK, there is now more money going into real offensive cyber. Being British, we don't like to call it offensive cyber. We <laughs> said we call it active cyber defense. Uh, <laughs> everything. David, I thought your question was, was fabulous. Um, you're absolutely right, I think. This political disillusionment is really what underpins all of this. There's a chicken and egg aspect to this. Uh, yeah, what came first? Was it actually all, the, all this, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the technology and the connectivity that created this, or, or was it there already? I don't know. Uh, well, I suspect, probably, the disillusionment had, uh, was, was simmering, at the very least, before this all got going. Um, it seems to me that what ICT has done, information and communications, all that, it's removed, not just distance um, from uh, the public, the voting public and, and, and their elected representatives, but also deference. And that's probably a good thing, I think. You know, they are just humans, after all. Um, you know, our MPs and whatever else. And why should we be, should we be um, uh, deferent to them? Um, so that, I think, is a good thing. But what we don't want is this sense of completely corroded lack of, uh, or you know, a, a very easily, um, uh, very easy condemnation of everything they do and complete mistrust of every single motive that seems to be coming out of their mouths. So I think what our elected representatives need to do to win back something like a more acceptable version of deference is to be more genuinely representative. What we find in the UK is that you elect MPs to go to Parliament, and what do they do? They spend all of their time to get, trying to get out of Parliament, where they should be doing the most important job, which is to enact legislation for the rest of us. They want to get out of that rubbish and get into the executive, because that's where you get a really you know, important career and a big salary and so on. Now, I think that's, that's wrong. We need to correct that. What they also need to do, all politicians everywhere, is be more truthful in campaigning manifestos and so on when they say they've got the answer to everything. And aren't we seeing this big style in the US? You know, that man is going to come crashing down when the Midwest realizes there are going to be no factories. Uh, so I, I think you know, we need more, more truth and more serious engagement with the people as well. Might take another pair. Yes, ma'am, over there. Hi, um, so thank you very much for your speeches. They were all really interesting, actually. I really enjoyed that. Um, my question is kind of jumping on the bandwagon that's covered in the last couple of weeks about a phenomenon called gaslighting, which we know is an old one coming from the 30s. Um, it's come up again in the relationship with Donald Trump and how he's actually relating with the news media. My question is, with the availability of information in the sphere in which we live in, do you still believe a phenomenon like gaslighting can be propagated the way it was back in the 1940s? Or is the availability of information and all the difference in the small groups and their different stories, will that prevent that kind of phenomenon from taking hold? Andrew McBride, I'm an alumni of the master's program of the National Security College. Um, it strikes me that some of the activities that uh, the adversary uh, foreign intelligence services, such as the Russians, what they've done is they've taken fairly traditional intelligence, such as the hacking into a political party in an opposition adversary country, and then basically publishing that raw information. I just wanted your view on how that kind of fits in with, I guess, the accepted norms of behaviour in cyberspace. Um, I'll speak to the, the first question on, yep. on, on, on gaslighting and the, the suggestions of, you know, this is the, the, the dropping of new implications of, of new allegations and suggesting them as, as probables, yeah, as potential, this is something that, maybe this is something that you should think about public as a suggestion. I'm, it's not me saying this, that's someone else has said and suggested this and perhaps someone should go and determine the truth of that. I, I think this is... This question of sort of dropping in allegations and, and news stories as allegations dressed up as news, I think it goes to this a loss of accountability. You know, I don't want to say back in the day, but back in the day, there were, accountability in the, was, was something that you could be acquired by um, having a strong history of being seen as someone who's truthful. So journalists, you know, their stock in trade was being, being truthful. And the accountability of whether or not their story stood up was that they kept their job or lost their job. Publicly, if you were to make an allegation against somebody, we had a court which again sought out defamation and libel. I mean, increasingly, with news sources now being atomized, as, we, as we've spoken about, and with information being globalized, the accountability of any sort of implication or in new, new implied stories is lost because Donald Trump can say something about 
a politician overseas, and there's no accountability there for him because it's just a suggestion. I could make an allegation about a politician in the UK, but because you know I'm in Australia, they're hardly likely to take me to court in the UK. The fact that we have an atomized news media or news sources means that actually accountability for the suggestions that people put up as alternative stories is gone. I think that's what at the core of this problem is. That, that question is no, it, there's no there's no possibility of loss for some individuals. That you know there's no reputation on the line, and you know the, the, the fact that it's a the internet and the, the way in which social media operates means that you can prosecute particular stories with very few repercussions for you personally. Mm. I think that's the new element to this, which is the, one of the most concerning parts. If anybody else wants to comment on gaslighting before. I suppose, uh, going to your question on norms in cyberspace, if you, you want to make the comparisons people often do with deterrence, nuclear deterrence, uh, before you had norms, you had deterrence in terms of uh, weapons of mass destruction. I don't think we're there yet, at the point where we have cyber deterrence in terms of information. It very much favours the offensive. Now, whereas in the nuclear age, the risks of physical harms, the pure kinetic destructive capacity of, of, of nuclear weapons, was a, a very strong check against their first use. Uh, I don't think you have a first use problem when it comes to, to information, but others might have other thoughts. Paul? Yeah, thank you. I, I'm not actually sure what gaslighting is, I'm afraid. Is it a sort of truth microcosm type of idea? That, or, or what is it? Oh, sorry. Um, so it's meant to be defined as the obfuscation of true news by putting out misinformation. Mm. So I meant it in terms of, I read a really interesting article by Al Jazeera News the other day that talked about how Donald Trump's actually using Twitter and the obfuscation of the news and coming across as a buffoon essentially right. to actually hide the fact that, for example, he's put 2,000 bills towards Congress in Parliament. So he's actually, many believe, using that to take away from what he's actually doing under the helm, which has been compared to people like Hitler and things like that who were using that news to hide their truth. Uh, I thought it was also um, that you, when you propagate gaslight, you undermine people's confidence in their own sense. Yeah. yeah. You can do it because you've got the power. So it's a misuse of power that compromises people's own ability to make judgments. Yeah. Coming from the film called Gaslight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to watch that on the way back. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Yeah, um, okay, well, in that case, I'll, I'll turn to the second question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the, the, the plain answer to you know, whether these Russian activities fit into accepted norms is that there aren't any accepted norms, um, and that's the problem. I do a lot of work on this with the, the Chinese government, actually, the UK-China cyber dialogue, track 1.5 dialogue, um, and we're st after three years we're still just in the foothills of agreement about what the most basic norms might be, and if you think that the Tallinn manual on the application of the laws of armed conflict to cyberspace all agreed, all published, and so on, still is not um, remotely near being uh, a UN-sponsored um, document of any sort. So there's, we're, we're in very, very um, unsettled ground, I think, uh, internationally, as far as the normative governance of cyberspace is concerned. A long way to go yet. Um, that said, as I, as I just said, this the discussion with the Chinese is making progress. Uh, it was out of that discussion that uh, Xi Jinping and uh, and David Cameron, remember him, had an agreement <laughs> about um, uh, not about uh, not about governments not sponsoring commercial espionage in the other country. Espionage, espionage is fine. We don't we don't mind that. That's what governments do. But we don't want we don't want companies stealing each other's um, intellectual property. So you know some progress, some normative progress, but very little. And at the same time as all that's going on, the normative um, slow motion movement, there is also something much more straightforward, which is just simple, uh, I call it a sort of, I don't know, a, a digital version of territorial struggle going on with the Russians and indeed others. This is pretty basic, Russian state interest. Um, and it's as familiar, I mean, you know, for, no, for good reason, there are people talking about um, a return to something like a, a Cold War type of um, relationship with not, when I say good reason, I don't mean it's a good thing, but you know, they're, they're, it's a, a supportable argument that we're, getting, we're heading back towards something like a Cold War standoff with, with Russia. I mean, Putin, I just don't, I don't ever, I've never seen Putin as a strategist, but he's certainly an opportunist, and he, he takes every opportunity he can uh, to plug away. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've just about reached time, uh, and uh, of course, 
if you haven't had enough alternative truth, uh, then we do have some propaganda uh, out the front that you might be interested in. Graduate programs are available, PhD programs are available, uh, and we will certainly be having much more to say uh, on this topic in the future, given the, uh, uh, given the uh, interest in it. Uh, let me also note that we do have a light lunch out the front if you would like to come and, uh, and partake. But before we do that, could you please join with me in thanking uh, our speakers today?